Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm so excited about what God has for us in today's message. I know it meant a lot to me and my faith, and I hope it does the same for you. So now let's go ahead and jump into Hebrews chapter 11. It's going to be on the screen. It says this, by faith, everybody say by faith, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going, that he would later receive. He set out in obedience, and sometimes God calls you to go, and you don't see immediate results, but you have to obey by faith. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He looked forward. I want to speak this morning on faith looks forward. Are we excited? Are we excited? Father, I come to you now. I surrender to you what you have for your people. I surrender to you my whole self, my feet, my hands, my mind, my heart, my mouth. Would you use every piece of me to deliver the word that you have for your people this morning? And God, would you move like only you can? These aren't my words, these are your words, and I believe that from the bottom of my heart. And so move in this moment, in Jesus' name, amen. You guys take a seat. Now you can sit down. You excited? You get to sit down. Awesome, awesome. Let's give it up for these guys for leading us this morning. Man, Palm Sunday, Easter's coming. But Palm Sunday is today, and so we're excited to, to worship on this day as we look forward to what is to come next weekend. We'll talk a little bit more about inviting and all of that in a moment, but I believe God really has something he wants to speak this morning. And um, a few weeks ago, Christina and I had the awesome pleasure of being able to go on a cruise. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. We went on a cruise, and um, we went some, with some friends of ours. We went a long time ago, I can say that now, uh, on our honeymoon, and we hadn't been again since. And then our friends called us up on Black Friday, probably about 10 o'clock that night, and said, hey, we found a deal that we can't turn up. Want to know if you guys would go with us. And if you know me at all, I'm not a very spontaneous person, not a very spontaneous person, especially when it comes to spending a lot of money. You know, I don't, I don't do that. Um, call it peer pressure, call it whatever. But I gave in and I said, this sounds awesome. We need this. This will be good to get away. Um, and we had the, the ability to pay for it. It wasn't a foolish decision. You know, we didn't put it on a credit card. We didn't do anything crazy. Um, we uh, paid for it and went on this trip. And it was an awesome time just to be able to get away. And I'm just so glad that we were able to do it, and we bought the tickets, we put it on the calendar, and then for the next few months, we looked forward to that trip. We looked forward to it, and we had to wait till the time came to get on the ship, but until then, we looked forward to it. When, when, when times would get tough, we looked forward. When Charlotte's screaming her head off at night because she doesn't want to go to bed, we looked forward <laughs> Amen, because she didn't go with us. And so, and I don't feel bad about it. Maybe, maybe y'all like, you should feel bad. You should take her with you. No, she didn't go with us, you know. So we looked forward. Uh, every Monday morning on my way into work, as I'm going down Highway 155, and I got the car in front of me going 10 miles per hour below the speed limit, and I'm tempted to lose my religion on them, I looked forward. And some of you understand what I'm talking about because you go down 155 and you get behind a car that's going so slow. And if that's you today, maybe you're not gritting, maybe you're one of those people and you need to get saved today and give your life to the Lord because the speed limit's 55, it's not 45. I'm just saying. 
That's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> but we looked forward because we knew, we knew coming soon we'd, we'd be on the beach, all right, in the Caribbean. We'd be on the boat. We'd be with friends. We'd be laughing. We'd be having a good time, not a care in the world, no staff meetings, you know, no deadlines, no, no, no kids, amen. All the lobster we could eat, we looked forward we looked forward, and I believe this. I believe our faith is just like that. It's just like that when things get tough, when times get tough, when you're in the middle of the fight, when you're in a season that seems like it won't end, we look forward. Our faith looks forward, and that's what Abraham did. Abraham lived by faith. You saw that. I had you repeat it when we read that scripture the first time. Hebrews eleven eight. 8, it said, by faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, and he did it by faith. He did it by faith, and that's the first thing I wanna talk about this morning. I wanna talk about faith. I wanna talk about faith for just a few moments. Throughout this chapter, we see numerous times this, this word faith pop up, by faith, by faith, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, Noah, by faith, David. And there's, there's name after name after name after name. And if you've never read Hebrews 11, I invite you to do that. I invite you to do that. If you're walking through a season that just seems tough and your faith is diminished, I invite you just to read Hebrews 11. Read about these men and women of faith that went through it, but they stayed obedient to what God had in front of them. A lot of people refer to this passage as the hall of faith. You know, like the hall of fame, but this is our hall of faith. I know that might be kind of cheesy. You're, you're welcome. Um, but it's easy to remember, right? The hall of faith. And, and all of these people had a calling from God, and they stayed obedient to it, and they made it into this hall of faith. They had different stories, different backgrounds, different struggles, probably different skin color, different hangups but they all had one thing in common. They lived by faith. And faith is a word that we use a lot in church, do we not? We use this word a lot. It, it comes in songs. Um, we, we, we say this word a lot, faith. And we, we tell people things like, well, just have faith, my brother. You know, and we say things like that to people. But then when you're in the hospital sitting next to a bed of a child that's dying with cancer, that's really hard to do. That's really hard to do. How do we have faith in, the, in those moments? Because faith can't just be blind optimism. It can't be superstition. It's so much more than that. So what is faith? I think in order to better understand what Abraham did here, what, what, what scripture's talking about with Abraham and the others that are found there in Hebrews, I think we need to back up to the top of the chapter. And so in Hebrews 11, 1, the author, who, who we don't really know wrote this, said this, said now faith, not by faith, but now faith. He's gonna give us sort of a preface before he gets into these stories. He says now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, this isn't a definition of, of faith. Like if you were to get Webster's Dictionary and look up faith, you're not gonna find Hebrews 11 verse one. I'm just telling you that now. You know, this isn't necessarily a definition, but it's telling you this is how faith works. This is what faith does. And the same word here for confidence is the same word for a foundation or a substructure. It's something that you can build on, that you can depend on because it's built out of something that will last. Confidence. Confidence, the same word that we would use for foundation, it, it, they go interchangeably. And it's something that we can rely on even when we're uncertain and even when we can't see it. We can count on it. We can have confidence. But see, we don't like to trust things that we can't see. We have trust issues. We like to function under the idea of seeing is believing. But that's not how faith work, works. Faith works by believing and then you'll see it. You believe first, and then you'll see it. See, but we don't like that because we, 
we have trust issues. Maybe we've been hurt by somebody. Maybe we've been let down at different times of our life. And so we like to, to see the proof before we believe and stake our life on it. But that's not how faith works. works. Faith works by b- believing and then seeing. And, and so think of faith as the foundation of your house, right? We, we, we build the house on top of the foundation. We don't always see it, but we know it's, it's sound and we can count on it. Um, when, when storms come, when winds come, we know our house isn't gonna blow over because it's built, hopefully, on something that will stand up during those times. Several months ago, back in January, y'all remember we had these tornadoes come through the area. And some of us were, were hit by them, and some of us got fortunate enough not to be hit by them. And uh, it blew through Griffin, right, where Pastor Richie and I, we both live in that same area. Their neighborhood got hit really bad. Our area got hit pretty bad, too. Thankfully, we were sort of on the, the fringe of it a little bit, I believe. But here's what happened that day. It was on a Thursday. I'll never forget this because it was quite a moment. Um, I'm at home with Charlotte, our little four-year-old. And Christina's in South Carolina. And we knew, we knew that day they were calling for thunderstorms. And so we were at home that afternoon. And um, all of a sudden, a friend of mine who's in church today, he called me and said, hey, there's a tornado warning you know, you better watch out, you know. And so I said, okay, well, I'll turn on the news. And so I turned on the TV, turned up, or turned on the app that we used to watch live news, and, and all of a sudden, the internet got really spotty. And so then I got my phone out, and I got the news on. And as soon as I got the news on, this same person called me again. <laughs> and, I, and I said, hey, man, what you want? He said, well, the, the tornado uh, uh, sirens are going off here where I live, just wanted to make sure you guys were okay. And I said, well, I just pulled up the news and I can only watch it on my phone because the internet's really spotty. And so I said, just let me go so I can, can see what's going on. And so we hung up and I was watching the news and this meteorologist that was on there was kind of telling what was going on in the area. And then all of a sudden he just got quiet and it looked like he saw a ghost. And he said, this is bad. He said, if you live near Griffin High School, you need to find cover now because there's a tornado on the ground. And about that time, our power went out. And I'm like, oh man, the internet's out. Now the power's out. There's a tornado. I can't see anything because we're surrounded by trees. And, and then it started to rain and then the wind started to pick up. And so they, they said on, the, on the, the report, they said, you know, find shelter, you know. And one thing that they said that I thought was really interesting, if you're ever in a tornado, this is just bonus material this morning, okay? Put your shoes on. And I was like, well, why is that? And, and, and it's because if the glass breaks or if something happens and you got to go outside, you're ready. You don't want to have, be having to find your shoes in your house after the tornado hits you. And I was like, well, that's really good advice. So we went and got our shoes. I told Charlotte, I said, go get your shoes. We met in the bathroom. Um, we had the flashlight on on, our, on my phone. And we just, we huddled in in the spare bathroom there in the middle of the house. And then it was just like a freight train was going by outside. You could hear stuff hitting the house. You could, you know, hear things breaking outside. And, and I, I literally, I was sitting there on the toilet with Charlotte. And I said, we're going to pray, you know, because she's old enough. We pray with her now. And we pray. We said, God, would you protect us? Would you protect the house? And would you protect the car? Those were the three things I prayed for. And thankfully, once this thing sort of ended, we went outside. And I went to the front door and I looked outside. And I didn't really know what I was looking at because there were trees down, you know, but thankfully, the house was good, the car was good, and we were good. And so just praise God that, that, that he came through. But in the midst of that, our house took a beating. Our house took a beating, but it served its purpose because it kept us safe. Now, once we assessed the damage, sure, some shingles came off, we had some siding damage. We had some damage to our porch, but the house did its job. It stood up when it needed to most. And, and here's the thing. Storms are going to come in life. Tough times are going to come, but faith gives us the confidence that we won't be destroyed. 
Faith gives us the confidence that we won't be destroyed and we're, we're gonna face storms in our life. That, that's for sure, there's no doubt. I can tell you that now and some of you could raise your hand and testify it because you're walking through a storm right now. We're all gonna walk through storms in life and sure, some shingles might come off the house. Sure, you might have some siding damage. Sure, you might have a mess in your front yard, but praise God that you have somewhere to go. You have something you can count on. You have something you can depend on when it matters most, and that's what faith is. That's what faith is. Faith gives you the confidence. Having faith, just because you have faith doesn't mean that you're not gonna have hard times, but rather in those hard times, faith gives you the confidence to stand. It gives you the confidence to stand. Confidence that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you. Confidence that he is with you in the storm. He's not always gonna take the storm away because sometimes the storm is for our good. Sometimes he just, he, he walks with us through it. Confidence that he is with us, that he's never gonna leave us. Confidence that he's holding you, that he's walking with you, that he's strengthening you. Confidence that he will never leave you nor abandon you. Confidence that he is your refuge and your strength. Look at this in Psalm 46. Look at Psalm 46, put it on the screen. It says, God is our refuge and strength in ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is with me now. I will not be afraid. God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is with me now, and I will not be afraid. I just want us to say that this morning. God is our refuge. Can you say that? God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is with me now. I will not be afraid. God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is with me now. I will not be afraid. Some of you thought you couldn't memorize scripture, but you just memorized a verse right there. And some of you need to make that your faith statement this week. When you're in the middle of it, when you're in the thick of it, you need to say that God is my refuge. God is my strength. He is with me now. I will not be afraid. This week, when you feel yourself getting overwhelmed, when you feel yourself getting stressed out, when the devil gets nose to nose with you and tells you you're not good enough, when he tells you you're not strong enough, when he tells you you're not cut out for it, when he tells you that you're not gonna make it, you look right back at him and you tell him, God is my refuge. God is my strength. He is with me now and I will not be afraid. Now, you might need to say it 17 times, but I tell you, if you say that long enough, your faith will increase and the devil will believe. If we believe that, if we believe that God is my refuge, God is my strength, he is with me now, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. And you say that, you put your confidence in it, you stake your life on it. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. You're still going to face storms. Jesus Jesus made us a lot of promises. Jesus made us a lot of promises in scripture. And he said this, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. But see, the verse doesn't end there. See, you don't, you don't see that statement. It's true, it's a promise. You don't see it on t-shirts, you don't see it on coffee mugs because it's not, it's not sexy. That's not what we wanna you know, focus in on. We don't wanna brag about that. In this world, we will have trouble trouble. But he says this next. How, how, does that, how does that verse end? How does that verse end? He says, fear not, because I have overcome the world. Fear not. You're going to have trouble. You're going to face storms. You're going to have seasons in your life you don't understand. You don't know what's going to happen. But don't fear, because I've already overcome it. That doesn't mean you're not going to have to walk through it. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have some shingles knocked off your house. Doesn't mean you're not gonna take some damage. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have a mess. But God can work through the mess. He can work a miracle in that mess. God is our refuge. 
God is our strength. He is with me now. I will not fear. And all of these people in Hebrews 11 all lived by faith. But they did it, and here's the crazy thing. They did it not having the one thing that we have. They did it not having the one thing that we have. Now, later on, they got a little bit more of it, but you know what that is? There goes the invite card. We'll talk about that later. They didn't have this. Now, sure, some of them, some of them had the, you know, the first five books of the Bible. They had about this much. Later on, they had the first five books of Moses that they could look to, read about God's faithfulness. We have the whole thing. We have the whole story. And we read about these people's faith in Hebrews 11, and they did it not having the whole story, yet they looked forward. How much greater should our faith be having the whole story? Because we know how it ends. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. One day he will wipe every tear from every eye. There will be no more sickness, no more death. One day we will be in eternity with him. But until then, we look forward. We look forward. We keep moving forward. And all these people in Hebrews 11, they had faith and they followed Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as in his, his inheritance, what? He obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Now, let's talk about what it means to follow. See, God had a purpose for Abraham. When God found Abraham, he was in a foreign country. He was an idol worshiper. But God saw something in Abraham that he wanted to tap into. He, he called him to go, to leave his country, to leave his family, and to go. And if you know Genesis 12, God told him, he said, go to a land that I will show you. He didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't say, hey, here's an address. Punch it in Google Maps and go and I'll see you there. But that's how we like to function, right? But that's not what God did with Abraham, he just said, go, start walking, and I'll show you where to go. Have faith and follow. Just go, move forward. And maybe you're here today and you've been questioning God's call on your life, thinking you're not good enough, thinking I didn't grow up in church, thinking I'm not smart enough, I don't have what it takes, this, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing there has to be someone better, but God is saying, I don't want someone else. I want you because I've called you to this I, and I've gifted you with what it takes to accomplish it. I created you for this. I've equipped you for this. I just need you to move forward and have faith and follow me. And like I said, God told Abraham to go, to go to a land that I will show you. In a nutshell, he said, you go and I'll show. You go and I'll show. But you gotta take a step. You gotta start moving first. And just to get real, real with you, for me, when I go to do anything, I like to plan and to prepare. I'll take step one if I know where I'm going with steps two, three, four, five, six, 17, 32, I wanna know the whole process. When I type into Google Maps like where to go, I like to see, well, what's the route gonna look like? Where are all the cops? Where are all the potholes? Where are all the detours that I might encounter? But God doesn't work that way because he knows that if we pull up Google Maps for his plan for our life, we might see some potholes, we might see some detours, and we'll never pull out of the driveway. And so he just says, go, I'll be with you. Just have some faith that I'll get you through every detour. I'll get you over every pothole. I'll get you through every distraction along the way. But first, I need you to take step one. I need you to take step one. We'll worry about steps five, six, and seven when we get there. In fact, you really don't wanna know what's gonna happen on step number seven, so I just need you to take step number one right now. I just need you to follow me with where you are right now and start moving. Start moving 
and I'll guide you along the way. Go and I'll show. A few weeks ago, we had one of our missionaries here, Bob Graham. I don't know how many of you were here that week, but it was awesome just to be able to hear from him, his passion for their ministry over in South Africa. And I was sitting right back there in the back of the room and he said this quote that resonated with me and it's still resonating with me. He said, you can stay in the boat. You can stay in the boat, but if you stay in the boat, you'll never walk on water. And man, that was just like chimes in my head. I was like, how, how beautiful. And of course, he's talking about Peter, right? Peter and the disciples there out on the water in a storm. Jesus had sent them on ahead. And he, he sent them on ahead into a storm. And they're out there, they're rowing. They're trying their best not to sink. How many of you ever been there before? <laughs> just trying your best not to, not to sink. And they're, they're trying their best. And then lo and behold, they see this, what they thought was a ghost out on the water. And Peter yells to Jesus. He says, if it's you, would you have me come to you on the water? And what does Jesus say? He said, come. He said, come. And then, then what happens? What happens next in the story? Those of you that went to Sunday school. He got out of the boat, then what? That, there we go, there we go. We like to focus on the fact that he got out of the boat and then he sank. Because we like somebody that we can relate to. We like, we like that part of the story because that's us. How many times you tried something and you started to sink? But, he, but here's the part we don't talk about a lot. Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water. He did something that no one else has ever done except for Jesus. And then he started to sink. We, we don't ignore that. But just let it sit in for a second that he had enough faith to step out of the boat and walked on the water with Jesus. And there were 11 more yahoos in the boat that said, more power to you, my friend. I'm gonna stay right here. We might be taken on water, but I'm gonna stay right here. You go, you go. This is too much. But Peter had the faith to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And that's what Bob was saying. You can stay in the boat, that's fine. You can stay in the boat because that's, Jesus sent them in the boat. But when Jesus said to come, Peter had the faith to get out of the boat. Now, Let's talk about the part that we like to talk about. Peter did sink. Bosco, why did he sink? That's right. He took his eyes off of the one he should be looking at, and he started to sink. My dad always told this story this way, and he's sort of embellishing it a little bit. We don't know if this happened. He said, probably it was Thomas, you know, the doubter. I said, hey, Peter, there comes a big one. And Peter's focus shifted from Jesus to the waves. And then he started to sink. He had faith. And he followed. And he focused for a minute. And then he lost his focus and started to sink. So I want to talk about focus. Lastly, we talked about faith. We talked about what it is to follow. But we have to focus. See, if Peter would have kept his eyes forward, if he would have kept his focus forward, locked on Jesus, he could have walked on water. He could have danced on water. He could have, who knows what he could have done out there in the midst of the storm if he would have kept his focus. Go back to Hebrews 11, verse 10. Put that on the screen. It says, for he, this is talking about Abraham now. Verse 10, for he was looking forward. 
looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. See, Abraham knew his purpose was greater than the present. He knew his purpose was greater. It had a greater purpose than what was maybe going on around him at any given time. He knew his calling was greater. He knew his purpose was greater. And he was focused on what God wanted to do through him. His focus was forward. He was faithful in the present, but he was focused on the future. He was faithful in the present, but he was focused on the future. And my question for you today is, Where's your focus? Where's your focus today? Where's your focus? Sometimes we focus on our past because there's things that's happened in our past that, that, have, that have hurt us. Maybe someone has hurt us. Maybe it was decisions we made. Or maybe we're focused just on our present, what's going on around us, but we're not focused forward. See, regrets look back. Frustration looks around. But faith looks forward. Faith looks forward. We don't want to be filled with regrets with what's happened in the past. Sure, we can learn from the past. We can glean from the past and we can learn lessons, but we don't want to stay there. We want to move forward. We don't want to get frustrated with where we are and get so frustrated that we become bitter with the circumstances that we're in, the situations that we're in. No, we want to keep our focus forward because faith looks forward forward. Faith looks forward. As I was studying this, I was thinking about the Israelites. I was thinking about the Israelites. They're enslaved in bondage for hundreds of years in Egypt. For hundreds of years, they're enslaved in Egypt. And finally, God brings deliverance. He brings deliverance. He, he brings 10 plagues on Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh's had enough and Pharaoh says, Moses, just take the men or just take the people and go. Just go. And if you think about the story, like God even lavished blessings on the people as they left Egypt. It was a celebration. They left, they had Passover the night before, and then they left the next morning. They left Egypt and they set out for the promised land. They set out for what God had for them. And, and I love the, I love I love the Bible and I love this story because it says. When, when God tells Moses where to lead the people, it says he could have taken them a shorter route. Could have taken a shorter route. But he led them into the desert and to the Red Sea. And so here are the Israelites. They're at the Red Sea, wanting to know what's next. And then it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then he sent his soldiers after the Israelites. And so here's the Israelites all of them encamped at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's coming in from behind. And then all around to the sides, they have desert. And in front of them is the Red Sea. But on the other side of the Red Sea is the promised land, the destiny that God has for his people. But in that moment, the Israelites, Israelites feel trapped. Looking back behind them, is Pharaoh and his armies, that's a sign of their past, where they came from, what God brought them out of, the, the bondage, the, the slavery, those things that, that they wanted so desperately to get out of, and God finally has brought them out of it, and now they're in the desert looking at the Red Sea. This is their current circumstance. This is their current circumstance. And so you see, see the picture, the, this picture is right here in this story. Behind them is evidence of their past, Around them is their current circumstance. But in front of them is where God's trying to get them to. They just got something in front of them. And, and I believe God brought them there for a purpose because he had something he wanted to do in order to show us his faithfulness. Look at this in Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Moses is talking to the Israelites. They're standing there at the edge of the Red Sea, complaining, complaining, murmuring about where they're at. They're complaining about their circumstance. And Moses says this, after talking with God, he says this, Moses answered the people, Exodus 14, verse 13. He says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you 
today. The Egyptians, the Egyptians you see today, you will not see them ever again. You will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on, to move on. Some translations say to move forward. But there's a Red Sea. But then Moses, he raises his hands, the waters part. We know the story because we love this story so much. And the Israelites pass through, not on wet, soggy ground, but on dry ground. God made it easy for them because he wanted them to see his deliverance. And notice, notice what Moses told them. He said, you're going to see the deliverance the Lord is going to bring you today. These Egyptians that have, that have held you in bondage, held you back, held you in slavery for so long. You're seeing them one more time. But after today, you're not going to see them ever again. But what I need you to do is be still. Be still and watch me work. Be still. See, when we have faith and we follow God and we keep our focus on him, he'll give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. In the midst of any storm, any hardship, any loneliness, any sickness, any heartbreak, whatever it is we face, he will give us peace in the middle of that. He'll give us peace. I'm going to steal a story that Pastor Richie tells all the time, and I love it. I think it's beautiful. There were these group of artists that were commissioned to paint a depiction of peace. They were asked to, to take the canvas, take their, you know, paint, whatever it is they're going to paint with, draw with, whatever. And he said, hey, go paint a picture of peace. And so all the artists break up. They, they take their time and they all come back. And then there's pictures of sunsets. There's pictures of meadows and, you know, maybe a park bench overlooking this scenic thing. I don't know what all the other paintings are. And it's because of this. There was one painting that when everybody looked at it, they were like, what? I don't get it. Because this one guy brought a painting, and, and in the painting, I looked it up just to kind of get an idea of what was going on. There's this cliff, these jagged rocks, there's a storm going on, there's lightning in the air. You can almost hear it in your mind. The waves are crashing against these rocks, there's water running down, and it is anything but you would call peace. <laughs> it was everything else in the book but peaceful. And they said, hey, man, we don't understand what's going on here. The, the, the task was to paint a picture of peace. And they said, this looks like anti-peace. You know, and he said, look closer. <laughs> look closer. And in the, in the rock, and you really have to zoom in to see it, there's a little bird on a nest nestled in the cleft of the rock. And he said, that's peace. That's peace. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the wind and the rain and the thunder and the lightning and the waves crashing, a place to go to rest and to be still. That's peace. That's peace. And that peace only comes through faith. And it reminds me of when Charlotte and I were in that tornado. Our cleft in the rock was that little bathroom. Just a, a place to rest and say, hey, I'm gonna put my hope and my confidence that this house isn't gonna fall around me, that God's got his hand on me. And Hebrews 11 is full of stories of people that lived by faith. And we continue that same line today. We continue that same line line today, following in the footsteps of those that have come before us. 
And I want to close with this. I want to go to the next chapter. The next chapter, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. This is beautiful. It says this in Hebrews 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, I used to think that this was everybody in heaven watching everything that I did. And I'm like, well, that seems like an invasion of privacy. I don't like that. But no, what this is saying is because of their testimony, everyone listed in Hebrews 11, because of their testimony, because of the stories we've just read of their faith and their confidence, because of their testimony, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Look at this in verse two, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus is the ultimate example of what it means to keep your focus, to keep focused. It says that the joy set before him he endured the cross. He endured what was ahead for the joy set before him. See, Jesus humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus left his throne in heaven. He came to earth. He came to earth. He was born in a barn. He was, after he was born, he was put in a feeding trough for cattle. He grew up. He worked a mediocre job, probably lived paycheck to paycheck. He was misunderstood. He was tempted, he was rejected, he was abandoned. And then ultimately he was betrayed and he was beaten. And just like we're gonna look at this weekend coming up, he was forced to carry his cross up that hill to die on that cross to die the death that you and I were supposed to die. And that's why when he was hanging on that cross, when it was said and done, he said, it is finished. It's finished. And his faith looked forward until he was finished. And I don't know about you, but I want to finish. I want to finish. Just like all the men and women that have come before me from the Bible on until now that have won the race and not given up and finished. I want to I wanna arrive in heaven and I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. And I don't know about you today. I don't know your story. I don't know what you're battling but I can tell you this, have faith that looks forward. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Have faith. Have faith. Faith that follows. And keep your focus. Keep your focus. Have faith. Follow. And keep your focus. Father God, we come before you now. We thank you for this opportunity. We've had to be in your house to hear from you the word you have for your people. I pray this morning that it is encouraging. I pray that people feel uplifted in their faith. I pray that they leave this place different than the way they came in. Maybe they feel defeated. Maybe they feel alone. Maybe they feel ashamed. Whatever it is that's happening in the minds and the hearts of your people here today, whether in this room or whether joining us online, I surrender them to you. I surrender them to you. God, would you meet their need? Help them to have faith. Help them to follow you. Help them to keep their eyes focused on you. 
and have a faith that looks forward. Let's keep every back, every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. If you're here today and maybe you have never taken that first step of faith to follow Jesus and make him your savior, you can today. You can pray a, a simple prayer that says, Father God, I come to you as a sinner in need of a savior. I believe Jesus died so I could be forgiven and rose again so I can have life. Today, I receive that new life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here today or whether you're joining us online, if you prayed that prayer, I just want to have you fill out that coral color card that's in the seat pocket in front of you. If you're joining us online, just click the button. We would love to know that you gave your life to Jesus today. And let me just say, life's not always going to be easy, but you enter a life of faith, enter a life where you focus on Jesus. It's going to make it a lot, lot easier. Amen, church. Can I just have 10 people just give testimony to that today? Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.